Welcome to the one within all back to another episode of Interverse. And well, yeah, wow, it feels like I haven't been here with you guys for a long time, but it's really only been around a week since the last episode. I've been on some adventures and you know how it is when you travel and you're doing a lot. Sometimes those one days feel like multiple days in one. And our guest today can probably relate to that. We've got the return of Yake Hagstrom, who is a Swedish researcher and uh, really deeply interested in alternate historical topics. I say alternate, but it could be more like the uh, the original when it gets into the mythology that Yake is fascinated by and brings curiosity to others about. There's really no ability to exhaust all the different tunnels and rabbit holes in a literal sense. We'll probably be talking about uh, a tunnel project that's coming up down the road for Yake as soon as he can get it going. But if you missed him on the last episode, you might want to go back and check that out. He's also got appearances on Michael Tesserion's Unslaved podcast and David Whitehead's Truth Warrior show, as well as his own YouTube channel where he puts up some of his research, some original music. He is a talented multi-instrumentalist and has created a lot of tunes over the years. That was one of the things we talked about the first time around. Uh, and so today we're going to just jump right in and we have a couple of things in mind, but we'll see where all this takes us. And uh, <laughs> oh yeah, to wrap up, wrap up what I meant about Yake knowing about one day feeling like multiple days where he's at, it's nonstop daytime, if I'm not mistaken. Is that true, buddy? Yeah. Well, uh, where, you know where I sit, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a privilege or <laughs> it's a, you know, we have 24 hour uh, of uh, sunlight, especially up in the northern part, you know, the closer to the like the polar circle, they call it. But uh, at this point, we have uh, 24 hours of sunlight. Of course, it dips beneath the trees uh, a couple of hours, but otherwise it's just, it's just, uh, you know, you need to have a good blanket over the window if you're going to be able to sleep. <laughs> but um, at the same time, we traded for the long winters, you know. So we're like coming out from this. We have like a saying when uh, when uh, there's winter here, we go into Ide or Ide. It's like uh, herbinating state <laughs> since old, you know. But I just think it's uh, quite interesting that uh, the same word for ID is ide, 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 the same. We get our IDs during the winter and we bring them forth in the summertime. At least that's how I used to like <laughs> work. But I can think in a more practical sense, uh, you know, in Sweden, since old, we didn't have computers and maybe we worked on some woodwork during winter, but Otherwise, not much to do, you know. <laughs> it's just uh, interesting if you have this kind of uh, perspective of nature and the cycles, you know, how to use them. And uh, it's sort of baked into the words also, uh, the old words, you know, how we used to live. Yeah, That's interesting with the word idea. Yeah. yeah. Wintertime. When you talk about hibernation, yeah, that's like dreaming and having your dreams. And then in the waking life, which would be the metaphor of summer, you put them into action. You plant those seeds. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting. Have you ever heard of the Siberian villages that were studied where people, the villagers would actually hibernate through the winter, similar to like a bear or something where they would literally sleep and go into a, they, I mean, I think they would get up and have small meals occasionally, but basically people would just like hibernate all winter, just the way the animals did. And it's some, I guess something that humans can do, maybe not unlike a Buddhist monk who goes into a cave and meditates for several weeks or for several months or even years. But it's quite true when you don't move too much and you don't have to exercise, you just stay inside most of the time. You, you don't need to eat as much either. You know what? I've been out of work like this entire winter or since uh, the new year. And I've been just like sitting home, like 
doing this kind of either in one sense, but you don't need to eat as much, of course. Uh, it can be a couple of days sometimes when you don't eat like a big regular plate of food, you know, but I drink a lot of tea uh, and <laughs> I drink a lot of tea instead, you know, so I keep, keep the belly full at least. I mean, you don't have to suffer, right? <laughs> you can still be like pleased. I mean, you perhaps you could like go into some, I, I heard about this, like the laying in the desert in some hole or just for a month without food. I heard about this kind of things, but it's something like it, you know, you don't waste too much energy on the practical. It's more like a, a mental, uh, more mental activities with games. And I can just imagine how they have been sitting there before, like computers and so with playing cards and, you know, all this kind of uh, activities that you can just roll on forever because you can play playing cards forever and chess and all this kind of games. It makes me think also, Val, you're talking about how it's a very natural thing and the seasons where you're at exaggerate this process of slowing down and then speeding up. And I was listening to... There's a teacher I really like, Seven Bomar, who just rebooted his esoteric radio podcast. And one of the things he was talking about was how we have this Western notion of everything being go, go, go. We got to fill every day with activities. And that's kind of like running away from just sitting and thinking and figuring out what to do with yourself or what the hell is going on or how you actually feel. And he related it to to life on a fundamental level through the, you know, the Phi or Fibonacci style spiral that mm -hmm. shows up in like seashells and all kinds of places in nature is like this, a metaphor of a coiling spring. And so everything is like in life is always like coiling, tightening up kind of con you could say constricting or contracting. Cause that's what things do when they get cold, they contract Literally yeah. matter does that. And then the warm up phase comes and it's popping off. It's firing off. So you can't just be firing off all the time. And that applies no. to a lot of things, right? <laughs> well, actually, I think it's a more natural state like they have in the more of the tropics area where it's like, of course, they have different seasons, but it's not as radical like in the, in the Arctic climate where they don't need a barn. They don't need uh, like storage areas that we have, you know, with wood and food storage and for all this kind of agriculture activities that we have up here that you don't really need in the tropics. That's more like their laid back style. And you can still see it if you go to like Vietnam or Thailand. I mean, down in Asia there, people are like more laid back than the Western people, you know. And I think it's a lot comes from the nature situation that they are in. I mean, we have the summers were always like work here because if you didn't collect enough food and, you know, prepared everything for the winter, you were, were sort of doomed. And the winters were much more harsh back in uh, like already in the 18, 1900s, you know much harder winters, longer winters. You know, they predict they thought it was going to come a next uh, ice time, you know, even. <laughs> and now they are like 180 the other way <laughs> because they were like flipping out and thought it was going to become another ice age, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's just interesting to see how the cultures also develop with the people uh, depending on uh, the climate, because it's a big uh, aspect. The, the Western people are more like uh, so the white people, so to speak, who I say originate more from the Arctic climate. They have a different kind of culture, uh, obviously, compared to like the Hindu or the <laughs> Thailand or Vietnam down in the more tropic. It, it, you can see it also in the behavior of the people and much more nature connected because the winter sort of disconnects people also from from the nature 
it becomes like a hazard almost. It's kind of an interesting correlation to the yin yang by what you're describing there. Cause I think what you're getting at is that maybe Western cultures that do have this like really active go, go, go mm. kind of like hyper masculinized or hyper left brain type of energy may have picked that up from all the harsh winters generation after generation where whenever the time came to get stuff done, you had to get a lot of stuff done. And those regions, the Arctic regions where more white skinned people come from, the land actually is covered in white all the time. And white is the yang of the yin yang. It's the active male principle. Whereas you've people in more tropical areas do have darker skin and they're more it laid back sense, and right? sort of relaxed and passive and receptive and let nature do its thing for them. And they don't have to do as much to it. And I think there's a interesting correlation there. And that's actually one of the questions I had for you was, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to talk about if there's any core, any like correlations to things in Bach saga with certain Eastern ideas. But before we go there, and we'll, that's just a preview, something I'll make sure we get back to. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to give my condolences to you about Jim Chesner's passing. I know that he was a big influence on your life and a good close friend. And so I thought in memory of Jim, maybe we could discuss his work and his life and uh, how he has taught people about the Bach saga, kind of as a way of also introducing Bach saga in general to people who are new to it altogether. Sure. You know, Jim, he is a, quite a character. He's like, a, like he described himself. He was like a, a joker. <laughs> you know, he was this random card <laughs> or the joker character. But anyway, he, I think he spent like over 25 years of his life, maybe more, uh, pursue, pursue, also pursuing the Bach saga. And, but he was a close friend also to Eeyore Bach, who came with the story, you know, who presented it for the first time in a thousand years, this uh, oral mythology. And they were, you know, they were a big group there in Finland with a lot of people. They are all like <laughs> major characters, but everyone has like their role in this. And the Jim, he is like the native American speaker because the Bok Saga can be spoken in three languages and it's the Finnish, the Swedish and the English language. They are you can you can sort of roll with the saga in those three languages so he was like one of two or three that got the saga pretty well that were english native speakers and uh, for those who know about the box saga has probably seen jim's videos that he made with a a russian uh, uh, what do you call like video? He he. There was a Russian who filmed those and. Those you talking about the documentaries he did? Yeah, he has made like a three part. They're very that, interesting. Yeah, very good, very well made. And on nice the language music. thing, I want to throw out there too that there's so much of English that's derived from Latin that although it's not a spoken language, yes, they say, but Latin stole. Latin yeah. is connected to this all too, probably phonetically. Yeah, but in the Latin language, they stole a lot of words from from uh, older languages like Swedish and I would say Swedish, but of course that sounds uh, horrifying. But I mean, the far as far as I understand, like my part of history, I'm gonna I, I can't speak in another way. But it's so fucking obvious when you get into it. Either it uh, the Swedish has been taken from the English, or it's the opposite way. But so the Swedish is definitely an uh, older language than, than the English language that were, or definitely Latin. But, I think uh, English was just cobbled together for the servant class, the serf class, uh, post whatever well, type of reset occurred that the more advanced older civilization fell to the 
current powers that should not be that we see in the world right now in the form of like the Vatican and international banks and these type of orgs? Well, uh, uh, let me put my information in that I got them from uh, from the the box saga. It's that the, the English language is around 10,000 years old and uh, it's based on now we're talking more primordial uh, <laughs> words, but the it's a combination of Aser and Vaner. And the Aser and the Vaner had two different languages that are called the Aas language and the Van language. And the, they were like in the Bach saga, the upper class or caste, you could say, in the ancient the, the world. Aser, is that correct? The Aser language is the the Swedish language. But the Swedish language is not really that kind of language. It's the more the most original language of the Swedish uh, language that the, I say it's Swedish now. But in southern Finland, they have a dialect that are called like Finnish Swedish. But it sounds a, a little bit different, and they construct uh, the, the sentences a little bit different. But it sounds a little bit funny, but uh, that's, uh, according to my understanding, that's the original, you know, like the what they call root language or the Aser language that they spoke in, in hell. And the Vaner language is the, the Finnish language. And for some reason, Finland, that was only speaking Swedish or root, they swap, so they uh, wanted to preserve this. Uh, I think I want. They wanted to preserve this uh, Vaner language. So most of the people in Finland now speak Van language. That is the Finnish language today. So, but anyway, this la English la language is a much younger language. It's a it's a global. It's meant for a global scale because the Van language. Uh, a lot of uh, languages on this planet derive from the Van language, according to the Bach saga. And uh, the more European uh, language group, or they call the Germanic language group, is the Aser language. Uh, it comes from the Aser language, the root language. So you can already see if you are uh, interested in like linguistic, uh, you pr should probably know about the Germanic language group and its pretty obvious that they have a common root and it's uh, the, the case is often that uh, or i don't know exact but it's the what the western uh, countries speak so to say but it's interesting i just wanted to pinch in when we talk about language uh, different languages this russian language <laughs> has always been a, a little stone in my shoe you know but <laughs> it's a, it's also a constructed language uh, like latin uh, it's a, it's not a, like a organic process developed. Uh, you know how languages can be like separating from each other first with like dialects and over time it becomes like, like almost a new type of language. But this Russian and the Latin are like man-made, uh, like the, it's made up languages, like the Elvish in the Lord of the Ring or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but with maybe <laughs> a more nefarious reason for being made up, in my opinion. Of course. Because uh, with Latin, in uh, at least in the United States and I'm probably in other English-speaking nations, the you've heard of the phrase legalese, right? Yes. Yeah, so there's contract language and legalese yes. that's used in courtrooms and that legalese appears to be english to us but it's actually latin in yes. the english grammar rule set and the reason that there is a copyright copyrighted owned by the crown corporation language that's used for law is so that the definitions of words are artificially and artfully controlled and updated by the masters of that legal system so that they their edicts and their decrees are more clearly permanent if you will than a more natural sounding language and how that evolves over corporate. time and meanings kind of flow through and into each other with latin it's the same thing like strict latin 
because yeah. the, it's called a dead language. What that really means is that the only real group using it is the Vatican, which is also a big legal hierarchy that's above the nation's legal hierarchies. And by keeping these languages out of the common people's mouths, it means that they, like I said, the meanings don't change. And what one Pope wrote a hundred years ago still has the same meaning yeah. in their system and by their rules as today hey, and back then. You, sh- you nail it, Chance. It's a dead entity and they wanted it to stay fucking dead. You know, this writing, Chance, this is uh, something that they wanted mon- uh, to have monopoly over or they had. We weren't supposed to be able to write anything, you know, according to the Catholic Orthodox Church, you know. The ordinary peon should not, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you could be killed for having this kind of knowledge about reading and writing before like the, the rebellion, so to speak. But this is kind of a segue into what I've been thinking about talking a little bit about, you know, with the, with the Swedish history, because they were like, they were like the real spearheads on these kind of problems, or at least uh, what they did. Because in the, you know, they were losing graphs there in the 1500s, uh, the, the church, at least the Catholic church were losing power in Europe. Uh, and this uh, gave rise to the, the Lutheran church, you know, coming really on. But if you ask me, I think it has been planned some kind of, it must have been planned for maybe two, three hundred years, this kind of thing that they did. What I think this is. You're referring to the creation of their own controlled opposition as in. Yes. But yeah, this is what the masters always do is they make it look like there's an uprising against the power hegemony, but it's actually been seeded and planned and it's controlled and funded by the very powers that. It is ostensibly opposing, right? But but this but the thing is that they have been creating this dead entity that you can't really grasp. It's like a, some kind of a, a being in the fifth dimension or something. You know this this kind of corporate, like how it works today with corporations. You you can't really reach the source of it. You can't. It's like some kind of floating entity that just. Keeps on rolling. All the there's no man to face. No, there's no man. It's just you're just going around in circles. You know when you when you have an issue. You know it just keeps on rolling on. And the church is like the first of this because it's only business. You know it's just business, business. This uh, kind of uh, setup that we have today with with how we live and everything. You know this can be a little bit upsetting for people to even consider. But you know with the with uh, a man and a wife and a household and, you know, all this kind of setup, the cultural setup that we have today is some kind of Christian uh, creation that came with it. But it's really good for business. You have like every man in their household is now the king or, you know, he wants to strive for his family to become more rich. And, you know, it's uh, everyone starts to struggle to, to, to get more and more and more because they are allowed to have this kind of private business almost like it's yeah. Uh, and the thing they're chasing is not wealth. It is debt. Literally no, but with the, the taxation the, that the, the charge entity puts system. onto them, it's just, uh, it's just encouraging people to, to bring in more money to the, to the, to the system. You know, it's a, uh, yeah. Cause the wealthier, uh, the, the working and middle classes get, that you know they get fattened up and fattened up over time and then there'll be some big event that transfers all of that fattening and wealth back to the elite ruling class yeah one like way or another that, like trillions were transferred from the lower classes to the upper 1% during 2020 like mm. a crazy amount amazon made so much money like small businesses were going down left and right i think it, i think you're right yak it's a it's a game that we're like, we're being farmed for our energy in a way. Yeah. But the, the, the thing is what I was going to get to is with the, they realized that it's this system had, you know, up here in, in the North, this system was, has been active for around, you know, 300 years up to Gustav Vasa the first, 
But why I'm so curious about those Vasa kings is because if, in the Bok Saga, they are mentioning that those Vasa kings are coming from a sideline of the of the box, uh, the box drama, so the the box family. Uh, I think it's via like the rostrum or it's some kind of sideline. I don't know. I'm I'm not really sure, but it's men- clearly mentioned that uh, this Vasa king has some kind of tie to the to the throne of Finland also, and they are ruling Finland because uh, Sweden was also Finland. There was nothing that was called Finland at that point, or they called it like Finland, or you could be hertig over Finland, but it was underneath the the Swedish uh, Empire. But I was just so curious because I also known that you know now when they make the uh, they had to like change the to create like a new problem or you know. It could be that everything is like just conspiracy and there's no, like no good guys. But this was a little glimpse that they should have some just intentions because at this point in history also, I think the Templar Knights, uh, the Knights of, Tem- the, you know, the Templars, we, ca- we call them Templar Riddare. And it's, uh, we have some really old, uh, like ruins, not ruins, but uh, we had like lodges. We have have been having lodges in Sweden since like the 1080s, uh, and this is around when Sweden also converted to Christianity. Uh, Sweden converted around 1048 or 1050 around there. At the same time, Sweden converted. Finland also converted. So they were the last in the in the north or in Europe to convert. The Russians were around. 1880, I think, somewhere. The English was uh, much earlier also. So at the time when Gustav Vasa came around, it's 300 years later, and he kicked the bishop out from the Vatican and take the system that uh, they have been creating here in Sweden with the taxation system and all the churches. He takes all this taxation money and puts it into the state instead uh, like underneath his bed <laughs> and he starts to use this tax income to uh, combat the catholic church and uh, uh, he was a templar everyone was a templar at that time you know sounds that like in the- gang rivalry <laughs> this is gang rivalry as, yeah. at his highest point <laughs> He's coming from a Jarl family from the heathen time, like a Jarl. It was only Jarls co- uh, left. Uh, so all the royal houses in all of Europe is Jarl uh, class uh, families, like the English, the Danish, the Swedish, uh, uh, Dutch. Uh, yeah, most. they're kind of fake royals because they aren't loyal. No, they they the thing is that they put those houses against each other. Uh, so you will get like uh, internal war within the nation in the process of uh, Christianizing it because those uh, families had big, uh, big power and influence, influence over the, over the society. Because when the Catholics came in, there was more of a earldom, you know, you had Jarls controlling certain territories and you have, you have like the king above them that uh, unifies it all, so to speak. But so, so they start to have like their own little states within Sweden. Oh, so so <laughs> it has been this kind of divide and conquer game. But anyway, this uh, Gustav Vasa family uh, comes from this uh, Ayar class, but they married into the Osser class uh, within Udenma, the via one of the sidelines from Bok, uh, from the Bok. Uh, family so they got like an elevated um title almost uh, a royal touch you could say but he started uh, you know sweden was the only like pure protestant country in the world You're talking about also. gustav what's his gustav name? the first uh, gustav vasa this is early 1500 so at that point, Sweden became sort of independent, but now they had a lot of loans to the Germans. It was all, it was uh, all, you know, this battle has been 
happening there a lot in Germany has been like the center point of this both uh, on a military scale but also kind of uh, information warfare you know the propaganda with the printing press started to develop also during this time yeah check out Michael Tesserion's website Germanophobia you can find all of his like 13 websites from michaeltesserion.com but he has one called Germanophobia that is just a collection of anti-German propaganda from throughout history. And yeah. it is probably only a fraction of what existed, but it's huge. This Gustav also was one of the first to use effective propaganda. He sent like images. And now this was also a time when people started to learn to read and write, because this is was the real thing with the with the Protestant movement, as I see it, like the best thing that came out of it uh, was the liberation of, of that. It's so huge when you think about it. Just going back to language in Latin, liber is book and freedom. <laughs> Same word for both concepts. So there's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. It's, it's a two edged sword because about to, you know, the French revolution, uh, they use the same tactics to, to get rid of the, the aristocrats, you know, the aristocrats that, you know, I, I see it like it's, it's a double-edged sword because this propaganda machine uh, Gustav Vasa did, he was like, okay, now the lion from the north is coming to liberate you from this horrible Catholic oppression, right? <laughs> like I was just thinking maybe imagery. literacy, maybe if some people had their literacy deleted out of their brain right now in 2021, it might be good for them just because <laughs> then they couldn't use their phone all day and uh, they wouldn't be able to read the propaganda articles. No, and but it was so simple, man. It was <laughs> it just might help them flyers, out. you know. <laughs> might make life anyway, a little simpler. It's an interesting word anyway with the pro- Pagan anda propaganda. It has some kind of uh, meaning into it, also. You know, it's a pro pagan spirit uh, if you render it through Swedish. <laughs> I never thought about that word in a pro breakdown pagan, before. Pro, <laughs> pro propaganda, propaganda. Yeah, it's a pro pagan. Anda is uh, the spirit, like uh, you can have team spirit or log anda or. This, the, you know, it's it's an interesting word also that. And that is like when you're, you can say you have good team spirit, like log anda, you know, you, you're synchronized. Uh, so it was a lot about unifying during this time that, uh, you know, the development of uh, inventions and all this also began, began to like shoot. It's something happened with the, when people started to be able to read and write more and more people were able to get like other kind of information than just that the information that came from the church, you know, and the communication with letters and all this also started to, this is aspects that we take for granted so much today. But if you really think about it, what, how much it, this is like the essence of the, what do you call it? Like the the building of the world that we have today is built on information and the communication and, you know, everything. So it's a world of words. Yes. So around a hundred years later, this uh, Gustav Vasa's uh, second uh, or his grandson, uh, or not maybe, maybe 80 years later. Yeah. His grandson, uh, great grandson. I think it is Gustav Adolf, the second he's called, and he's the only king that has gotten like the title, the great. And uh, he's barely mentioned in like history books, but uh, even Napoleon was like a big, uh, he studied this king and his tactics because he was like the inventor of modern warfare, this guy. Uh, so he had developed like new kind of ways of, uh, behaving at the battlefield or the, how you train soldiers and also like new inventions, like uh, lighter field cannons, uh, boats with better cannons that you could like sink ships with artillery only. And, you know, stuff like this. Uh, the pistol was invented during this time. It's a Swedish invention also. Uh, 
you know, all kind of things started to develop in like 80, 100 years time. We were so far ahead uh, compared to other countries in Europe that were still underneath the Catholics. So this uh, Gustav Adolf, the second. Makes me wonder if this guy wasn't packing uh, some knowledge from an earlier time. And it wasn't really that these were inventions so much as he was breaking this stuff out for the people no, uh, to resist the other gangs. And he had access to, to some of this. I mean, not that there's no invention that's true. involved. It's but, very true. Because I think a lot of true. technology that just bursts onto the scene out of nowhere could have been seeded by somebody who knew something that had occurred in the past because of their literacy or their access to older records or even an oral tradition. Well, it's very true, Chance. But the, the case in the military, the military is often like the opposite uh, function. Uh, but the idea is just turned, uh, hun- uh, you know, instead of creating people, you kill people. And uh, even like the, the military ranks are ranks from within the pagan uh, world system. Like... Uh, and the, the costumes and everything is based on the on the heathen traditions in the that but this is I think this was Gustav Vasa's sec, uh, the first second son that came up with the first with the military system with the captain or captain you you cut on ten as a cop ten you cap like, you know it's a it's a dividing. Uh, each name has a dividing function. So like one captain has 10 underneath him, for instance. But all those kind of ranks are coming from uh, from, uh, coming from the from the heathen world. That's for interesting. Instance, He's the head of 10 because cap is yeah. uh, from capito. And in Latin, that's a, a prefix that refers to the head of something. And then you have 10. Tan. Yeah, cup tan. Cap t- tan. Yeah, so that's interesting. For instance, uh, you have also, there's another, I was searching for the word. I should have a list of this actually, so I can ra- go through it, but it's interesting. It's coming from this new kind of uh, structuring of the military, but they use the old heathen uh, system, uh, but they turned it 180 degrees around and made, uh, made them to soldiers instead. A lot of pantheons and heathen or pagan gods or traditions are very focused on 10 uh, as a representation of like the the chief god or the the god in charge, the boss. You have in the book book family also you have 12 sons, but there's uh, the firstborn son. He he's he's raw. No, I mean, that's. uh, that's the yeah he's raw and the the the, the last son he's becoming the bok or the 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 balder, back the bok the last but one but the brothers in between they are called ten tin tu so they are also ten brothers that uh, they could have different uh, kind of functions uh, ambassadors or whatever important uh, roles like but. Uh, I think it scales down. There's a nice image in a book uh, that I remember now where everything is structured down, where you can see the entire system. Can Can you think of any other correlations to like the pagan connections to military traditions? That's kind of interesting. Like the The word sergeant or lieutenant, do those words have any meaning? Or I mean, general makes a lot of sense on its own. It's called lieutenanten, lieutenanten. In Swedish, the lit- yeah, we even pronounce it here, lieutenant with the ten in it. Yes, you have the ten. Yeah, there's always ten underneath. I would reckon, <laughs> or he's in charge of ten, and like one lieutenant uh, is head over ten captain, perhaps. <laughs> you know, maybe the Romans there's some different a, a practice where if their if their soldiers if like a group of their soldiers got out of line, they would decimate the soldiers, which deck D E C is a Latin root referring to 10. And what decimate meant would be if your troops were out of line, you'd kill one out of every 10. So every Mm -hmm. group of those, every captain would lose one of their men as a punishment, I guess you could say. And maybe every one out of 10 captains got killed. Who knows? 
that was a hardcore Roman thing they used to do. You know, they spin so much about the Romans, man. I don't know. I know that the Romans were also a heathen empire up to the 300, a pagan. So they, the Colosseum for me is like a bigger circus. You know, it's uh, maybe later when it was hijacked in the Rome, uh, later Roman times when it started to become more like the Mahabharata war, you know, war, uh, war stories and this kind of war stories uh, creates a different kind of people also. The Roman stuff just blows my mind lately because I've been studying North American architectural history a lot. And there are places like in Chicago during the world's fair exposition, for example, which was mm. a long time ago, the, they had basically the exact same architecture and structure as Nero's Circus Maximus from ancient Rome and all over North America, there are ruins from everything from aqueducts, like water, ancient waterways that are built out of impeccable brickwork masonry to these wild cathedrals that look straight out of, uh, <laughs> straight out of Europe where these have been co-opted by the church a long time ago, but inside these cathedrals were always pagan symbols and pagan uh statues and all kinds of stuff so i think that we are <laughs> david whitehead says all the time if you think the fake news is bad how how is the history it's probably even more fake of course and i think that there is strong strong evidence for anyone willing to look at it that even in north america it wasn't just native americans in teepees with animal skins that they had Maybe it wasn't that group of people that built it either, but that on this continent and every continent of the world, even also in China, there's the same style of stonework and masonry that reflects the cathedral styles that you see in Europe and also the what is called Greco-Roman style with like the white columns and things like that. But it's everywhere and it appears to be older than the time frame of European settlers getting here. That's uh, and the more I look into it, the more convinced I am. I've, I haven't looked at a place yet and not realized, wow, this story makes no sense. Like, like Harvard, for example, I was looking into Harvard, the famous university here. Hmm. And this is a common pattern throughout the United States that uh, places that have really old prestigious universities were set up by the Catholics, <laughs> the Vatican, of before course. United States time, usually. And Don't so you see it, then these get deal. turned into universities, universe cities. But <laughs> there's also in those same towns, like giant, gigantic cathedrals with huge spires and copper roofs. And it's all made out of stone and there's carvings and statues. And like with Harvard, what was so stupid about it when you look into the official history was that there wasn't even a need for a university yet. It was a small town of like a few, uh, just a handful of several thousand Puritan settlers. And they built supposedly this giant Greco-Roman style, incredible architecture that became Harvard, the, the university, in anticipation that they might need a university soon because people were going to move there. So does that make any sense to you that before you even need it, you would build the most elaborate and expensive architecture for this purpose and uh, apparently spare no expense and do things with the building that people don't even know how to do today and couldn't replicate? It looks like it was just moved into. Hey, what's the search for? It's like giving out information. But Controlling now, information, you mean? And yeah, and that's and that why also, they can own the universities. Exactly. But they don't. They don't. They didn't even need to control the information back then because they had monopoly over the information. Uh, every you know, people didn't have access to books or anything. Where where do you get information? You know, the only place you could go to get information, you know, that was not from other people that probably didn't know much either. Just gossip, perhaps, but just information, raw information. Go to the church. But now, I think uh, in more 
uh, not modern times, but pre-industrial times, you know, when the universities, I think the universities is around 400 years, 400, 400. Yeah, Harvard was supposedly built in like 1670 or something, but yeah. that's just one example, but they're numerous. But it's, what I'm saying is that the, the, the universities almost become like the the next tier of church. <laughs> you know? So now they change like the apparent is uh, not really. They still have the white clothing there, but before. Yeah, but what do you wear when you graduate from the college? You wear those black, right? black robes. Looks a lot yeah. like what but those you priests know what? are wearing. The priests are wearing black. That's the black color is actually like the color for the church. The, the, the white uh, thing there. I don't know. Maybe it's a more Protestant thing. No, the new but, church is the white lab coated doctors and yeah, so called scientists that are but it's, directing it's a hard, the world it's into hard such to wonderful tell. places. <laughs> There's so much that has been happening since the French Revolution. I would say those ancient orders might have been having a good cause. I think the Johannit order, like the nice hospitalers, I think those it's the, like the first. I think those had a pure purpose maybe all the way up to Napoleonic age, I think they were, maybe there has been some kind of uh, infiltration already before, but certainly underneath, like in the 1500s, when the, those orders were at its peak, I would say 15, 16, 17, beginning of the 17th century. Uh, so on that subject, do you have anything else you want to unpack about fraternal orders and secret societies out of, Sweden or Finland, because we talked a little bit about that a few weeks ago. And well, you got footage of looking around town at all their architecture and buildings on your YouTube channel, I'm pretty sure. Is there anything else you want to get into with that stuff? Well, I just want to mention, uh, there's not so much on it, actually. The, the thing is, we have been having the uh, Johannit order, we call it, but it's the Knights Hospitallers. And they have been around here in Sweden, at least from the 1080. And that's, if you look at Wikipedia, <laughs> this order shouldn't exist around that time even. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, the, these nice hospitalers, they were seated, uh, they had a big like seat down in Malta. Uh, and if you look at the coat of arms they have, they have like the Danish flag in the middle. But this Danish flag could be, I saw there was another order also that had this, this flag. It's this uh, red and white. You know, the, the stripes are red and it's white in the, on the sides there. But it's the Danish flag also. But Denmark has always been like a stronghold also as uh, for the, the Knights Templars or the Knights Hospitallers, they call them. <laughs> so what do you, I mean, these things have changed and been co-opted over the years, but what do you think, at least in the Danish and Swedish regions, what the original purpose of the Templars, for example, would have been? Do you think that on some level there was a, a positive intention to keep a hold of the pagan traditions or pagan wisdom? Well, it's the, as I see it, it's, it's those Jarl families the Earl families that uh, went underground when the church uh, took over the last part of Europe, that was Finland and Sweden. And uh, from that point, they uh, had to work like underneath the church, but they had like those secret meetings at the spas, uh, those spas, uh, they have spas all over the place, you know, it's, it's, it's a place where the, you can see if you follow any Templar, they should at some point in their life go to some kind of spa. You know, if you read some biography from some older, at least I have been finding out they have been meeting at those. Uh, it should be uh, the case. It's some kind of side track. They have their agendas, but they still work underneath the Pope, so to speak, but underneath the nose, right underneath the nose. And they they hide their messengers in like uh, hidden in plain sight uh, architecture and uh, children's uh, songs and you know all this kind of uh, small stories 
but it's just interesting the name Knights Templars. We say in Swedish we call them uh, Tempelriddare. And uh, Tim- Riddare is a rider, it's a it's a knight, you know, uh, it's a this knight title or the knight thing is a heathen kind of it's coming from the heathen military also with the with knights it's a function in the pagan system so to speak it's a, the costumes and helmets and all this is just uh, symbolical stuff for the functions with the lances and swords and all of this they it's a different kind of symbology but uh, the knights templars they were using temple you know temples temples they, they have the temple in the name they they are knights of the temple and the, the pagans used temples and the, the churches, or I mean, the, the Christians used the church. So it's a, it's a reference to the pagan, to the pagan world also with the temple, the temple riddare, they call them, or the knights templars, but it should be like knights temple or temple of the uh, knights of the temple, which should be rendered more in, in English, if you ask me. <laughs> But, and the uh, Christian world doesn't like to call their structures temples too often. No, I think a, the, that's words. why they ta- called it the Knights Hospitallers also, because maybe when they got a little bit, bit more cocky during uh, the 15, 1600s, maybe this is where also the name Knights Templars start to pop up. I don't know. It's just a speculation. But <laughs> as I understand it, it's the Jarl families that got together and made this organization and it was sole purpose just to preserve the memory of the tem- uh, pagan world that the christians destroyed so it has always been about preserve preserving and also to like uplift humanity in their ways uh liberating i don't know uh, you think they've been co-opted at this point though i think they got uh, infiltrated around the maybe before or after or underneath the French revolutions, there was so much happening during this time. What I have been seeing is that there were a creation of a new orders during this time also. And in Sweden, they created three new orders uh, slightly before and after. Uh, Crazy stuff French- was going on in the North yeah. American region at that time too. So much has been happening. The so-called civil civil war, wasn't that? Far off from the Napoleonic age, if I'm not mistaken, it's not too far off. You know, this uh, it was like a, of, the whole world, the power yeah. system shifted, and yes, something and, uh, happened. Enough death and destruction occurred in the that time period that I think a lot of history could have been completely destroyed and rewritten around then and in the few decades that follow. I mean, they call the post Civil War period in the United States Reconstruction. And to me, I think that that's a nod to the fact that they're reconstructing the entire society and the people's view of their own ancestry and history. And most people can't trace around here, cannot trace their ancestry even back to there, let alone further. Not that they Uh, couldn't if they really tried, but they've we've lost the thread. Like families don't keep track like that. Only the oddball uncle or somebody in your family might be interested in genealogy <laughs> well it's it's uh, often if you have like uh, if you're living in like sweden our church is uh, the oldest uh, church that are not like the christianic church like we have the svenska kyrkan is this this the first church uh, outside of the catholic church so to speak yeah, on a nation scale but from that time, every person that was born got like a number and uh, not a number, but they were cataloged into the church books. So anyone in Sweden can go and check their ancestry if they have ancestry back to like, for, in my case, uh, I go all the way back to to the 1500s when they started to do the recordings. I have papers on like, but it's my grandmother who has been doing that sitting in the archives, you know, <laughs> but it's possible uh, in uh, European countries, I think at least uh, Germany, perhaps uh, England, you can do it. I don't know. 
when all the you know nation state controlled church popped up in the rest of Europe but this is what I wanted to talk about a little bit with the Gustav Adolf the second there because he made this all those inventions I was talking about and he just marched straight into Germany and uh, in many cities they just open up the the gates so to speak so you could just walk in and kick out the controllers and just left it I don't know exactly the details on how everything happened but the result is quite obvious today um, if you if you have like the right eye to look at this because there was so much damage that uh, was done during this crusade on the Catholic uh, Catholic side, so to speak, uh, especially with the monopoly of, on information. Yeah, yeah the, and the, there could be in that time period, uh, the Templars swing a little towards collusion with the church or maybe that was sort I of on the surface so. level on the surface <laughs> level cooperation but like you said behind closed doors not really cooperating because th that was when the templars were during the crusades setting up their old banking system that the church definitely liked that <laughs> they took that yeah. on and took yeah took this was the major thing that they took over when they uh, were kicking out the bishop you know the first thing they did was to take all the money and then started to just them uh, taking out everything from the churches like gold and silver everything was just taking out even the bells they took and made the cannons instead of with you know <laughs> here in Sweden they just ripped it all down and gave the bible into the household instead so people could read it in their home you know so you kind of move the church to to the household level but of course, when the king had a big announcement, people could gather in the church, but it's a nice locale, you know, to sit and listen. <laughs> but it's just a, it's just an earth shattering period in history. If I could travel back in a time machine, I would go back to the 1500s for sure. That's my first stop. Hope I won't get killed by any pistol. But <laughs> <laughs> Just to see what happened, because it's so bold, so so bold move. Well, we got a few more minutes left in the first hour, and it, maybe it's too big of a topic to get into. But I wanted to check in and see if you could uh, tell me about the project to try to get into the uh, the temple that has been underway oh, oh. for a long time. Sure, I have uh, I have kind some of give new us information. A, the rundown of what that whole plan is and uh, what you guys are trying to do there for anyone that doesn't know what I'm talking about. Well, this is really not my table, but I have gotten information quite recently. They made a couple of years ago, uh, they scanned uh, uh, the, the area with the like modern, you know, this uh, ground penetrating radar. And where is like, this at again? So people know. This is in Helsinki. In Finland, in Snappertuna, I think it is. It's a uh, or Gumbo. It's like a two, two, 20 kilometers from Helsinki, the entrance there. A Gumbo Strand, it's called. But anyway, the entrance to the temple is supposed to be there. And, uh, uh, you know, they have been digging there since the 80s, of course. Uh, there has been a lot of operation there ongoing, but it has been st standing still for years also. You know, the, it's a tough, tough project. And there's a big stone there that are like balanced, they say, on the... <laughs> on the on, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to work on, as I understand it, because there are... The uh, it's a water lock there, so it fills up. You need to pump all the water out, and it's just it costs a lot to work on it. So it's all about funding. And if but there's the, any artifacts in there, and you just came yeah, in and blew but, it all open, you could damage what's there too. Yeah, it's the but the, it's a pathway there that they are trying to follow. But it 
when they left it after they had been making the big, the big excavation where they have been able to blow far far in into the mountain there now when the water has settled and it has been going a couple of years everything has been like uh, it's something called like uh, it's it's a dust that are coming from the from the bedrock that are making it to become like cement almost so now they had to <laughs> like go back to square one i think but anyway they have been doing some kind of uh, ground penetrate uh, ground penetrating radar scannings with uh, some kind of technology and uh, the result is on youtube actually when they go through it and uh, they they see that there are some kind of uh, openings there you know so they have i think they got a pretty good idea where to go with the next step and that is to drill like a hole down and to send in some kind of sonar or camera or something so i think they will be trying to drill down to the temple actually with a small hole and put in a camera there and that could be quite interesting to see the results so i yeah. think that's coming up and uh, the other thing is that they have been creating a foundation that uh, are in the process of being uh, granted uh, like the approval of the of the government there in finland because they uh, need to go this way if they don't need so they don't need to tax the money they reason so if the if the finnish <laughs> authorities don't want to help them with the, this uh, dig they shouldn't be needing to taxate the money also for the project so that uh, you know they of course they are going to dig in but uh, they are just waiting for this foundation so they can accept money for it because they are actually people willing to contribute to this so so you, they're trying the to be thing. able to get their donations without being taxed all the hell yeah pun intended exactly. <laughs> So that's like the next thing, but uh, there has been no activity this summer because of COVID and uh, last year, the same thing. So, yeah, interesting how many important things that were right on the verge of culmination have been slowed down by all that. Yeah. So everyone is just sitting and waiting. So we were actually supposed to be in Finland right now, but uh as it turns out, uh, you need some kind of vaccination to be able to go, and the people from this group are not too uh, excited about vaccinating themselves. Yeah, it's so, not worth it. <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing's I, worth that. I can always take the boat over, but it's quite far anyway. But <laughs> it's start walking. <laughs> it's a sea between them. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you got any thoughts to uh, leave the first hour people with before we move over to our premium side? Well, I haven't even spoken about what's in the temple, but the, we don't That'll have to, to be. The, we can start off over there. We'll give some little tantalizing yes. thing for them. You can wonder so much about what could be in there, but <laughs> leave that for the imagination. I know that there are statues, at least, of, of the king and queen for each generation. And the uh, but there should be other kind of artifacts also, uh, like uh, maybe something that are related to that time or era of each raw, like a raw. <laughs> it's, hey. it's an epoch. It's an epoch of each raw one king. So yeah, it all fits together in the words. Box saga is a very interesting piece yes. in the puzzle. I'd <laughs> that's like the, to that's see. The what, <laughs> I, I would definitely like to see some uh, verification come out of that project <laughs> in my lifetime. Pretty cool. There are more sites to be dug up also. So there are a lot, uh, a lot of practical things involved in this store. That's, you know, it's so tangible, the, the linguistics and, uh, you know, that's, and you have the history and you have this archeology. span So very, very striking when you start to, take it seriously actually very very i agree it's never been a better time to open up our minds and dump out all the uh stuff handed to us by the state and by the church and come in with a blank slate and start asking the most basic questions about where we're at and how we got here because yeah the uh, answers we've been given just definitely do not 
jive with the self-evident reality that we find ourselves in? No, it's better to be like a child and start from the beginning. Uh, sometimes that could be a a nice attitude because if you bring all your luggage with you, maybe you miss something. You know, it's uh, that. I think that's what's open-minded. Really yeah, is, you know, that's right. And yeah. uh, in a metaphor for life, you can't ever take anything with you but yourself. So just bring that curiosity, and uh, you don't need much else. Well, <laughs> when you're studying, it's nice to be able to to know something and uh, to build on it. Of course, I mean, if you start to uh, like. If you start to, uh, what do you call it? If you start to be unsure if, if it's not true or not, you know, uh, anything, it's, a, it's not too good either. But there are methods to, to this also. Well, I'm going to wrap up this first recording and we'll move over to part two. But sure. I want to thank you for being here and encourage everybody to check out the stuff that you've done online. <laughs> Is there anything you'd want to direct them to specifically, my man? Maybe I can uh, put a link to you to my because if people want a little bit more, you know, I, I don't produce too much videos, but there will certainly be more. There's some good stuff uh, on your YouTube. It needs more yeah, subscribers. But it's very, it's very like specific. But anyway, it's quite interesting. Anyway, if if you're a nerd like me. <laughs> Yeah, guys, check the show notes for a link to Yake's YouTube channel. And yeah. we'll see Plus members on the other side. All right. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. All right, we did it, everybody. That's the end of this episode. Was, as always, a really fun time to talk to Yake. We actually talk quite often not in recordings and sometimes he pops into my telegram voice chat room when i open those it's been a while since i opened a voice room in telegram but it'll happen again soon i've just been on the road a lot the last couple of weeks and it feels like it's been a lot longer than a week since the last episode was put out but that's all it's been i guess life and traveling adds a lot of layers to your experience and makes it all feel more stretched out but that's the funny thing about routines when you're in them time goes quicker and you're doing the same thing over and over again. And it's almost like your life is getting shortened in a strange way. But anyway, I had a lot of fun with him as usual. And I hope you guys go follow his YouTube channel, check out some of the other content he's done out there on the internet, like with the unslaved podcast, Michael Tessarion and David Whitehead. David's also got episodes with him on truth warrior. He's probably got more than that out there in the world but this time around in the second hour if you don't know the drill already you get the second hour on rockfin or patreon and there are links in the show description for that not too much money and you get quite a bit of extra content double the episode length every show so this time uh he told us yak told us about his wisdom of homemade tea making and how to get the life force energy out of the tea leaves in the best way we talked about the two-headed eagle symbol that's popular with secret societies and where that may come from, from his perspective. St. George and the slaying of the dragon, that mythology and what it really is about and the uh, uprooting of paganism by the church. We also talked about sexuality and modern day taboos and how what the box saga describes about sexual practices is quite a bit different than the way that modern people look at creating children. And then one thing that was really interesting was that Hermes character, Odin, Thoth, all the same guy, really, in my opinion, that, uh, that guy came up in conversation <laughs> and he's been really on my mind lately. People I know tell me they talk to him or it, whatever it is. Uh, we also talked about what happens when we die. Talked about spirits and ghosts and how they may be connected to the tombs and preserved bodies of ancestors. And I threw in some speculation that the Vatican's really a bunch of necromancers with all their strange knuckle bones of a priest and hair shirts and all this other strange shit. So, yeah, um, one thing that was interesting 
about the plus extension was that last time we talked, we talked, we discussed Hermes in uh, the uh, conversation then as well. We talked about the Emerald tablets. So I guess there's something to it because <laughs> I didn't plan to get into talking about Hermes a second time, but I will link Yake's first appearance on Interverse in the show notes as well. It was a good one, just like this one. Talked more about music and sound, which is always fun. I'm a big time sound healer. Uh, so where have I been this weekend? Well, or this week, I went to this festival called Reconnection right outside of St. Louis, Missouri. You may have noticed my voice was a little weird during this interview. It's because I've been recovering my vocal strength after that weekend where I kind of inhaled a lot of dust and it was really hot and I didn't get enough sleep. Got a little bit of the look flu or what you might call a common cold after that. Seems to always happen after I'm sleep deprived, but it was worth it to put all that energy out into that weekend because I just kept meeting incredible artists and healers and light workers. And as far as music festivals go, it may not be your experience with them that this is common because I don't think it's that common, but there were more light workers, for lack of a better term, at this event than there were party people that were just there to have a good time or get messed up. So I really appreciate that. Some of the art that I witnessed there just blew my mind, including, I want to give a shout out to Bruce and Cammie, who I met there, who are a couple of painters. And uh, Cammie had this painting of, it was actually three paintings of uh, the Hermetic great work, if you will. It's just so amazing. And I want everyone to see that. So go to Venusian Visions on Instagram and scroll through that. And I'm going to, I don't know where she got this text because I was trying to Google it and couldn't find it. I'll try again. But there's these like alchemical texts embedded into her paintings sometimes that just blow my mind. And this one really just stuck with me. So I wanted to read it to you all here in the outro that I saw on a painting at a music festival this weekend. And it, it goes like this. For I am the watery, venomous serpent who lies buried at the earth's center. I am the fiery dragon who flies through the air. I am the one thing necessary for the whole opus. I am the spirit of metals. I am the fire which does not burn, the water which does not wet the hands. <laughs> Sounds like something Hermes would say. So uh, tap in. Everybody get in touch with that force that is beyond the other forces, but also they extend out of that one original prana, or I think Yake called it Mahala. And that's it. That's the life force source. And we all have that. It's either a little spark or a blazing fire within us. And it's also wet and it's also earthy and it's got everything about everything in there. And that's what we are. So I hope that you guys are tapping in as well. I'm having a pretty good morning so far. I'm getting ready to kick off the One Day of Brightness event with Lindsay Sharman of Rogue Ways, where she and I and a couple of other teachers and speakers will be presenting and providing in informative and helpful, maybe even healing entertainment for all the attendees of this online event. So that's going to be really fun. And another thing that I really enjoyed at the festival was a friend of mine who makes music under the name of Flintwick. I've played on the show several times in the past. He had some new music that really blew my mind. So I'm going to play us out with this track called Grotta. And uh, as usual, as usual, everything's linked in the show notes of everything we talked about that needs a link. And other than that, I'm going to get out of here for today. Hope you guys are having a really awesome one. And I will talk to you soon. Much love out there. Don't forget to get the second hour of this conversation. You jump on Rockfin or Patreon and look up Interverse. And way easy to do that on the uh, show notes of this episode. So catch you guys on the flip. Bye-bye.